It's Welcome time for the grand finale of our two-day event. He was with us yesterday, gave us a glimpse of what you're about to hear. So let's switch back to the Microsoft Conference Center where the founder of GlacierWorks, mountaineer, filmmaker, and more, David Brashear, is going to tell us about his work on documenting the vanishing glaciers of the Himalaya. Let's listen in here as he is introduced. I need to now introduce our speaker, and uh, he's well-known for many things. Uh, traditionally, you would say that he's climbed Everest five times. He's an international acclaimed venture filmmaker. He's reached, uh, you know, he's got four Emmys uh, uh, and he's currently executive director of Glacier Works. Actually, the most important thing is to tell you that he, in his youth, he was known as the Clover Dance Kid um, for climbing as a teenager uh, a, a rock face that experts have had to do some extraordinary things and he just went straight up. So he, that's how uh, he became known as the Clover Dance Kid. The other thing that I'd like to mention, uh, how many of you have heard of Dick Bass? Dick Bass? Okay, so he, he owns uh, Snowbird in, in, in a ski resort and uh, he's the first person to climb the seven summits and, and David Brasher was his guide up Everest. So he's done many, many things. Uh, he produced a wonderful IMAX film uh, with Ed Vistas, who's the, you know, the American who's climbed all the 8,000 meter peaks without oxygen, who lives out just, just near Seattle. Uh, and so David has done many things. Uh, and what he's going to be talking about is, we've heard about, you know, machine learning with big data and so on, but really one of the most important things is being able to explore it, to visualize it, uh, and to do mashups and all this sort of stuff. So he's going to talk about a very important part of big data. Uh, it's a particular application of science, and uh, he's got some great footage taken when he was strapped to, a, strapped to the outside of a helicopter in the Himalayas at 26,000 feet. Must have been interesting. Um, uh, and anyway, you'll see some wonderful stuff. So he's going to talk about uh, rivers of ice, the vanishing glaciers of the Himalaya. So, David. Thank you. Great. Thanks, Pam. Thanks. And I put a jacket on in honor for David. So did I. <laughs> I wore a jacket, too. So thanks, Tony, for the really kind introduction. I have to say it's really wonderful to be here in front of such an illustrious audience. I'm a mountaineer and a filmmaker. I'm not a, a scientist, but we've spent our days up here uh, working very hard the past five years to bring back um, imagery about the uh, melt rate of glaciers in the greater Himalayan region that we hope you'll find compelling and, and fascinating. It's really important to me before I start to thank some people in the room uh, at Glacier Works, we just count our lucky stars that we've had this warm embrace and this wonderful relationship with Microsoft uh, Research. Uh, we're the content providers, and then Rin has this beautiful tool for telling very interesting stories uh, and a web presence, uh, this rich interactive narrative. Person that started off it off for me a few years ago was Curtis Wong. Uh, sitting here, very important uh, force in the Worldwide Telescope. Along the way, uh, Rick Zaleski, Eric Stolnitz, uh, Matt Newtondale have uh, been very important in our growing relationship in building a big team here at Microsoft Research. But I really uh, have to give uh, a big hug and embrace to Joseph Joy, who's our, our, our team leader at Microsoft Research in the RIN project. And we're all becoming not only uh, people who are uh, working on this team, we're all becoming very close friends. We have a shared mission about how we see uh, that image uh, data can be visualized and presented out to the world in a very compelling way through uh, stories and a narrative. And uh, we also have shared values, which is really a good thing to have. We, uh, we believe that we bring a certain level of integrity and authenticity to the project, and that means a lot to uh, the team that I lead at Glacier Works. Um, there's a few others involved. There's a team from x -Reds and they're in uh, Southern California, that's uh, Eric and Greg, and a team that's worked on this Everest fly through movie that I'll show you, and that's uh, Ben and uh, David Boardman down in uh, URC Ventures in Portland. So I guess I wrote some notes here about what I would uh, cover. And 
I think a little bit about me, I would set up the premise for this. You've heard I was a climber and a, f a filmmaker, which I spent some years as a real misfit. Then I had to earn a living uh, in this uh, up here on Everest. So I did climb it five times. And along the way, not only did I become uh, adept at, at operating in very high elevations in a very extreme climate, but at storytelling. Because I've climbed that mountain five times and told five different stories. And the first one was the first live broadcast from the summit of Mount Everest in uh, May 7th, in 1983. Big old camera. Uh, back then it used a tube. So that's quite a ways back, a Plumicon tube in a camera and a little two gigahertz uh, microwave uh, transmitter held between the legs of a Sherpa pointed down to the Mount Everest View Hotel uh, 20 miles away. Um, then in 1996, well, we got that beast of a camera, that 42-pound IMAX camera to the summit of Everest. The tremendous engineering feat by the IMAX engineers because the thing started out weighing 80 pounds. We said no Sherpa can carry that to the top, so they lightened it and they made it function to our test parameters, which we had to freeze it for 24 hours in minus 50, and the thing had to work because we were not going to get a team of people to take it up uh, to the Earth's highest uh, point and have it not work. The camera was the easy part, but then it used um, 500 feet of film in 90 seconds. So there was a lot of changing of film up there, and it's just such a luxury now to have these video cameras with memory cards that we can just shoot and, and shoot with. Um, 1997 for Nova, we made the first live webcast from the summit of Everest. So I guess the story here is that we were very early adopters of, of emerging technologies. But it, w the reason we adopted those technologies is they helped us become more effective and better storytellers. And that's why, I, again, we're very pleased and just um, it's so wonderful to be here working with uh, the RIN team. I finally got to a point where I climbed that mountain enough. I, been on it 13 times, 45 expeditions, maybe 50, lost track. And one then could say, well, does your life amount to a hill of beans? You know, what contribution have you made? Maybe you've climbed the biggest hill of beans in the world. Um, but here I am, this storyteller climber. What bigger contribution can I make? And I was sent off on a project and was quite surprised with some match photography, which I'll explain in a minute. I was quite surprised by what I saw. I saw tremendous uh, changes happening in the greater Himalayan region, and I was shocked at how bereft I was of knowledge of, of why it was happening, and also the, I was astonished that I hadn't noticed it. I'd walked across these glaciers to get to big mountains since 1979 when I was 23 years old and made my first trip uh, to the Himalaya, having seen a picture when I was 10 years old of Tenzing Norgay standing on top of Everest, May 29th, 1953. Famous picture taken by Sir Edmund Hillary. And, and here I'd had this long journey, and now I wanted, I guess, to, uh, to, be a, to tell the story of what was happening with the glaciers. So we set off um, into the field in, uh, that would be October of 2007 for the PBS series Frontline to get them a single match photograph. Back then, the biggest, cheapest sensor we could afford was a six by seven, a negative uh, six by seven centimeters in a Sai Pentax still camera. And well, we never looked back. And so in five years, it's been, uh, well, 11 expeditions, but to keep the math simple for me, I'll make it 10. So 10 expeditions, an average of 40 days per expedition, so that's 400 days in the field. An average amount of ascent and descent of about oh, 60,000 feet, the 600,000 feet of ascent and descent. An average of 100 to 180 miles on foot, so 1,800 miles, um, and, and we love it. You know, it's when we're out there, we are, are you know, I feel, People have, find this hard to believe, but our team that are built with veterans, tough Sherpas who've climbed Everest many times, it's hard work up there and it's dangerous work. And so I tighten that circle of excellence right down to where it's so tight that only the best people are, are up there. These teams are small. We don't have a lot of funding for this project and we're efficient too and we do our work. So we're, I think we're happiest minus 20 or minus 30. 
uh, at 25,000, 24,000 feet, uh, sleeping on the dirt with the drogba, with the Tibetan nomads, and eating uh, dried goat because um, it's a very stimulating environment. And you, you get rewards when it's satisfying to work that hard for uh, the imagery. So we have uh, the story of how we've made that journey is going to be a component of this presentation. Another component is going to be our relationship with Rin, and we'll move into interactive imagery. And then we'll even move into this, uh, this Everest fly-through movie that we're working on. So the idea here is to show you the evolution of this and some possibilities for what Rin can be. Now, because Rin doesn't exist in a form yet that I can play it on my computer, and we're working very hard to have it ready uh, by the end of the year, I'm going to show you components. So I just ask you to bear with me as I move through different players, because the beauty of, of RIN will be when we don't need to move through different players and everything's available on HTML5, and it's all seamless. So we started here. Well, there's Everest. It's a beautiful mountain in the sunset like that, and it's also a very a big peak. What I'll do is I'll stand over here, because this, with this pointer, I can't hit bo both screens. Then I'll put on the bane of my current existence, my glasses, because they're hard to use up in the mountains. Here's Everest, and um, there's 29,000, 28 feet high, Lhotse, the world's third highest mountain, Nupsi, the ice fall. So this is where we go to work. This is where we spent 400 days. And the point of the project, when it comes to climate change, is very uh, simple and, and focused. This is a very, very big landmass here. It's the highest landmass in the world. It's the Tibetan Plateau, High Asia. It's bigger than Western Europe with an average elevation of 4,500 meters or about 15,000 feet. That means that this place that sits at a very southern latitude, um, the same line of latitude that passes through Everest passes through Orlando, Florida. That, um, it's, it's, it's under a tremendous amount of uh, pressure in the summer from the sun and from heat. But this place is the ultimate canary in the mine for how glaciers respond to climate change in this part of the world. And, and their, their response is very uh, rapid, and the signal is very strong. Of course, there's great variations in what happens up there. Before I switch to the next image, just keep in mind the scale of it. If we started up here in Pakistan, northwest pa Pakistan near K2, that would be northwest Colorado, and way over here, where the Tsongpo Brahmaputra makes its big bend, leaving Tibet and entering um, Arunachal Pradesh, and then Assam. This would be Orlando, Florida. So it's a very, very big place, and of course there's variations in, in the weather systems. You get the southeasterly flow here from the monsoon, which deposits precipitation in these mountains in the summer. And here you get the westerly flow, which deposits tremendous amount of snow here in these mountains in the, uh, in the winter, which means you would expect some of these glaciers to be in better shape than these glaciers over here, which is true. And yet, someone who wants to cherry pick this information can find one advancing or 10 advancing glaciers here. And advancing doesn't mean they're moving out like armies uh, uh, hundreds of feet or miles a day. It means they can be thickening a centimeter uh, in a good season. And, uh, but anyway, the point is, we often see a report that says most of these glaciers are in the state of um, retreat, but 10 aren't, and yet uh, certain uh, uh, groups or people will take those 10 uh, glaciers and consider them benchmark uh, glaciers and represent all the 35 to 50,000 glaciers in this region, and that number varies on how you cut the cards. So why does this area matter? Because the Yangtze, the Yellow River, the, sorry, the Yellow, the Yangtze, um, the Mekong, the, the, the Sawin, the Irrawaddy, and then here the Tsongpo, Brahmaputra, the Indus, the Sutlej, the Ganga, and the Karnali all have their headwaters there flowing, and these headwaters are principally fed by streams and snowpack, and a groundwater recharge. So this is where we've been. 
We've been to Kachanjunga, the world's third highest mountain, 28,000, I think 150 feet, Everest 29,028 feet. Choi Oyu, you won't recognize that name, it's the world's sixth highest mountain, it's 26,600 feet. Kailash, for any Hindus in the room, or Tibetan Buddhists, or Jains, or Bonpo, this is the navel of the earth and the holiest mountain on earth because four very important uh, rivers flow uh, within, uh, begin their journeys to the sea within 80 miles of the summit. And then up here in the Karakoram, we have K2, um, the world's second highest mountain, 28,750 feet. So the, these are iconic places and they get people's attention. And so here's how it started. Off to the north side of Everest in Tibet in October of 2007, tiny teams back then didn't even have the money to bring a couple of Sherpas along from Nepal. But, you know, when you can get two monks from the monastery at Rongbuk at 16,200 feet, and they were born and raised there, and they, these are fit guys, and they know the terrain, and they're good companions. So that's, that's the beginning for the entire project. A match photo, a comparative photograph. George Mallory, the famed... British mountaineer who died on Everest in 1924 and coined the phrase uh, when asked too many times why he was climbing Everest, why he wanted to go back, he said, because it's there. And, and I guess that's why we go back over and over to these glaciers, because uh, they're there. And we want to learn more about them. You go to the Royal Geographical Society, you thumb through the archives, which I know quite well, having made many films about Everest over the years, you find an image taken by George Mallory. Then you have to find where he took it from and occupy the same space and try not to make too many mistakes in climbing up the wrong 19,000-foot uh, ridge and descend descending 5,000 feet and climbing up another ridge. But we know the terrain pretty well, and so here's what you end up with, right? Here's a photo from 1921, and here's a picture from... Uh, 2007. So there's a change happening there. At Glacier Works, we're not uh, scientists and we're not going to tell you how that change happens. We're going to have scientists tell you the story.